I am Clementine Wamaria, uh, but you may call me joyful. <laughs> I am humbled and grateful to be here. First and foremost, I am so thankful um, for an incredible team behind The Girl Who Smile Beats, my memoir, A Crown. Uh, they have worked tirelessly to get me to this podium. And second, I am just so incredibly grateful to my co-author, uh, Elizabeth Weil. Uh, she spent five years with me um, to bring out this, this baby, we call our baby, out. So five years of an incredible work. I was born in Kigali, Rwanda, one of the most beautiful places I've ever lived. The moment I was aware of myself and our, and our lives, I realized where I was, in a place of joy. My childhood was a true joy. It was a dream come true for my parents um, in all kinds of ways. Um, my mother had this incredible garden and as you can see, I am always behind flowers. And she wanted to create the Garden of Eden. And so if you had to come to our house, our mother would have enticed you to be like, where are you from? What seed is your, you know, what flower, what seed can you bring me next time? And so my mother had engineered every flower from all over the world to be able to be in the garden. And so sometimes I find myself in different states and I'm like, we had that flower. And I wonder who came from, you know, Kansas City and brought the flower to our house. So to be honest, um, I grew up in, in a very incredible childhood. Um, and of course, from age zero to six, um, I was very loud mouth. I talked way too much. I paid attention, but at the same time, I also repeated everything that everybody said, and sometimes not things that I should be repeating as a five-year-old. In 1994, when the conflict in Kigali started, I had no idea what was happening around me. But I, I knew that it was in a way of me going to my mango tree and screaming on top of my lungs. Some of you in this room might know more of what happened during the conflict in 1994 on television. What you saw maybe was sort of a fourth wall into exactly what happened. I was six years old. I wanted to play in my mother's garden. I wanted to snoop in my sister's things. I pretended to, pre to be stronger than my brother and faster, while the whole world around me was completely silent and while many around me were being murdered. You see, when the conflict started, I didn't even know what death was. I had asked. What happens to people when they die? But this time, I couldn't even fathom the idea of one person killing another person. There are chapters in my life that I wish not to keep repeating. I have been repeating some of my experience for the past 15 years now, and honestly, it's been a nightmare, and I don't want to do it anymore. And that's why I put it all in the book so I don't have to repeat it. But the little they tell you once you've written the book, <laughs> uh, you're gonna have so many reporters and so many people ask the same question. And this time I've had it maybe in like five different countries keeping asking me the same question. I'm like, can you read? that I don't want to talk about anymore. This is why I spent literally 15 years trying to get this to you. So if you're a news reporter, if you're a t wh whoever you are, I don't want to talk about it anymore. 
Today, I wish to walk you um, to my passion, history and literature, which are my inspiration for gathering my experience and turning it to something you can hold. Audre Lorde asks me, what are the words you do not yet have? What do you want to say? That's why I'm here. I'm a huge nerd. When it comes to history and literature, ah, just words. I'm that student in your classroom who will extend to every vocabulary. And my passion might annoy you and it might impress you as well. I take the words I take the vocabulary, I take every action so personal to a point where, as a teacher, you might be like, shut up, Clementine, it's the past. And I'll look at you and I say, no, this is current. It's not the past. At age 14, my favorite subject, of course, was um, literature because I just started English. I just started to learn how to speak English. And so every word, every vocabulary in history, I put it under a microscope. In fact, because of that passion, I still have notes uh, from several of my classes since eighth grade. In seventh grade and eighth grade, when we started to learn about the world wars and all that violence that humanity has risen upon each other, and it's pretty ironic, actually, that we are at Caesar's palace, <laughs> where many stories of war begin in that Colosseum. And we have continued this story. And it's absolutely a tragedy. I pay very close attention. I plug in. I want to learn the secrets of how, why, when, who, and oh my goodness, how to stop this story of war. How do we stop the story of hate? How do we do that? After a few grades and learning each chapter, how on timeline, the factual information, why the war started, what were the political parties, the ideology, what were the, who was involved, who were not involved, the key terms. <laughs> From seventh grade to all the way my senior in college, I was like, what? Why am I keeping repeating the same thing over and over and over and over again and all the teacher pretending that we're learning something new? The type of the humanization, the act, the means of killing, the death toll, X, after chapter, to unit, to a test, to a grade, I was aware that humans, at least the ones from the past, had not yet learned the things from all the hate and the mass killing and wars. So right after I graduated from Yale University in 2013, I moved to California uh, because it reminds me of Rwanda in San Francisco. And I created this little place uh, to be able to call home. I wanted to go back to what I had written uh, in 2006 uh, at the, uh, when Oprah uh, Winfrey show uh, had an essay contest on why night by Ali Wiesel matters today. I had made a point at that time when I was 18 years old that history does not repeat itself. We repeat history by not communicating the experiences from a personal level. So I gathered everything that I had learned from many teachers, from many people, to be able to bring every person to a journey that I will not, 
not wanted to go back to. No one in my family, no one in Rwanda, no one in Burundi will ever want to go back to. No one who experienced mass killing or oppression in that love will ever write to write. So I wanted to immerse myself in that. And I did. And I was lucky to find Liz, um, Elizabeth Well, who helped me, walked me to this process for five years. The Girl Who Smiled Beads. The title itself comes from a fairy tale. It's one of our many fairy tales in Rwanda, but it's like the adventure of Alice in Wonderland. The story I grew up hearing from my nanny to be able to make sense of the world. And the girl roams from one hill to another, one country to another. She's able to observe and take in the world. And then when people pause to look at her, she pauses and then she smiles. And then when she smiles, gems, beads of all kinds appear everywhere and people collect it and they do not see her. My life uh, with my older sister, Claire, who was 16, our life after the conflict and during the conflict was unlike the girl who smiled beads. We started off in Rwanda and we walked and we found ourselves in a place uh, that had thousands of other people who had fled also from Rwanda. At that time, I really did not know why everyone had left their homes. Now we're sleeping outside. And for the next year, our life was just to live outside and everyone, the way they looked, because many people had lost their families, many people had lost everything that they ever known, just like us. And so, you might call me, um, maybe I should extend it to that, but from Rwanda to Burundi, we lived in a refugee camp and uh, with many people who sought refuge. And the life there, it has never been on a camera, it's never been written. I'm the first one to write about that. To a beautiful country at that time, Zaire, beautiful, beautiful, right by Lake Tanganyika. It's like California and Hawaii, if you were able to mix it together and then put a little bit of desert, and that's Congo, this part where I grew up. And then there, we're starting a year later, and my sister and I taking little that we had and moving to Tanzania. When we got to Tanzania, they had a, created this police people who were just rounding us all and putting us basically in the prison. And my sister refused to accept that kind of ways of being, and so we left. And we ended up in eight different countries, and we migrated to the United States in 2000. And that's Chicago, and so Chicago has been my home since before I left for college. I'm giving you a little bit, a more extended version to give you context that there's no, there's no story like our story because no one has ever been able to survive that atrocity and is able to stand in front of a camera, in front of a Caesar's palace and talk about it. And I know that my story in terms of when it comes to such a hatred and violence, um, it's not a new story, but it's a story where I've given a context. I call myself the most expensive camera that was sent into places of war and to the press of after war. And then you get a book. I do not want to walk you there. And so, I am incredibly grateful because the book gives you not only, you know, I, I, I wrote, the beads offers the reader a close lens, a front seat, I should say, of what happens, warning signs that I have, uh, I've saw before the conflict in Rwanda and then two wars in the Congo, the daily lives of civilians the life of aftermath of being a person seeking refuge. The chapters rotate between past and present. The story are not chronological because 
what is chronological anyways. I want the reader to be able to experience themselves, to be able to experience what hate does. As Eli said, yes, it's, a, it's exciting, it's, it's, uh, it's massive, but by the end of the day, in Rwanda, husbands killed wives, wives killed husbands, neighbors killed each other because there was this violence, this hate that had been stored by many people who came and told us that we were not alike, we were not humans toward each other. And so, guess what? It's happening here. It's happening there. It's happening also over there. And so my hope is that as all of you as a teachers, how many of you have experienced such a conflict such as a genocide? How about war? Well, then I invite you to go in Rwanda and observe of what happens, but most importantly, what happens when people come together, when people indeed rise above hate. You will see it in Rwanda, but also you will see it here of so many people who've been oppressed in this country, many people who, who belonged in this country you will see it that in our eyes. And I hope that the girl whose smile beads give you the emotions, gives you the deep feeling that in which we are numb to.